<laughs> Welcome back to Hoops HD, everybody. This is our continuing 2021-22 preseason coverage. Uh, this is our preview of the Big 12 Conference as we've been recording them. Uh, we're recording this here on the evening of Monday, October 25th. Uh, same night we recorded the SEC Conference. I don't think I mentioned that when we did our SEC show, but oh well. Um, but if you are looking for all the other previews, go up there. The Season Preview tab has all the links to all the podcasts. I'm your host, Chad Sherwood. On my side here, I've got John Titel and David Griggs directly below me from bracketeer.org. And I'm going to say it correctly this show, <laughs> Rocco Miller. I don't like liked it when you said it the other way. <laughs> We've got Joby Fortson and Matt Sikowski as well. Uh, a lot to get to in this conference. This conference had been the number one conference in, in the country by Ken Palm ratings, at least for several years. The last two seasons, it's slipped all the way down to number two. So shame on the woo, woo, Big 12. Woo. Only put seven out of 10 teams from the conference into the field last year. I mean, you know, really, Iowa State, what the hell? But um, let's start, I guess, the place to start. And uh, if you, you start know, with Iowa State, I'm quitting. Well, David, I was going to talk to you first, but just for that, just for that, I'm not going to talk wait, to you first. Wait, Joby, wait. I'm going to talk to you first instead and talk about how about the defending national champions? I think that's where you've got to start, even if they're not going to win the conference. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think they'll win the conference. This is still a very good team. Uh, it's got so much talent. And you know what? They still are that same Baylor that just comes at you in waves. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, they uh, I, you know, you, you lose some guys in the league, et cetera, but they, they're, you know, they, they then replace it with, and you should be going to Titel because, you know, he can talk about Kenjo better than I can, <laughs> but the, uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They have so they, they just have guys come off the bench like Flo Vamba and I, I, this is a very good team. Does it have that X factor that brought them the national championship last year? No, I don't. Uh, but I, I mean, this is a, this is a sweet 16 level team that could have the potential with the right, you know, with the right pieces to make an even further run. Uh, do, are they going to win the conference? No, we, we all make our picks at the end of these podcasts on who we think is going to win. I don't think any of us will say Baylor, but darn it there. I will be, my jaw will drop to the floor if they are not in the tournament. And I fully expect a protected seed to come along with it. John, he called to you, so let me, let me ask you, uh, James Akinjo, can he make up for one of those losses of a Macy Teague or Butler or Mitchell, the guys that are going off last year's team? So a guy who started with me in D.C. at Georgetown then went to my alma mater in Arizona and has now left me. You want me to get on his side? Forget it, Chad. <laughs> Plus, uh, there's just – you can't lose Jared Butler and Davion Mitchell and others and be as good as last year because that was a special team – I mean – when you beat an undefeated Gonzaga team in the title game, you know you have a special team, and that's because you have special players. And even though you have some good ones this year and a great coach in Scott Drew, you can't replace them overnight. Yeah, I mean, um, that's – they're not going to be as good as they were a year ago. I, I mean, that's that's hardly a hot take. They're not going to be the national champions, and Scott Drew will go firmly on the hot seat. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I think that – I, I, I think they're a top 20 team. I think they could, they're sweet 16 caliber, maybe even a little better than top 20. I remember when Scott Drew got the job at Baylor, he was at Valpo. And I remember thinking at the time, this is a really good coach. He's walking no, into a mess and we'll probably never hear from him again. Baylor hadn't been to the NCAA tournament in 50 years or longer or something like that. Um, I would, I, I, I don't want to say that, he doesn't get appreciated at all because that's kind of understating it. But as far as the job he's done, and most people don't remember what a mess that literally they had, they were coming off of a, of trying to cover up a murder. That's it. I don't know if any programs ever been in a bigger mess than Baylor was when Scott Drew got there and they had no real history of winning. I can't think of another coach that has done that good of a job with the programs that they were at with all respect to Duke and Kentucky and all the great coaches that are there. They weren't a mess when they got there. Is Scott Drew one of the best coaches in the country? Uh, I think it'd be hard pressed for anybody to say no to that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I know I absolutely agree. You know, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, 
I mean, what Mark Few has done at Gonzaga almost comes to mind. And you talk about taking yeah. a non-power power conference school into a perennial national championship contender. Uh, but, you know, but to do this at Baylor, the, what Scott Drew came into, I got to agree with you completely there, David. Uh, let's move on to another school, though. And, and Rocco, the pick that I'm seeing for most people to win this conference is Bill Self's Kansas Jayhawks. Uh, how good is this team? Is it Final Four good? They certainly could be, and they, they're certainly being projected there uh, by several. I think the um, you know the pros are they've just got a ton of talent. They have pros, right? So mm-hmm. you, you look at Agbaji coming back. I think Jalen Wilson still might be the most talented player on that team. David McCormick's obviously a talent. Uh, you know they're in the middle six ten. They've got some nice pieces coming in to layer in. Uh, Remy Martin was right yeah. there for Pac-12 Player of the Year. Joseph Yusefu took Drake on his back and got them into the tournament last year. So guys like Yusefu and Martin create some of my cons for this team. Like, you know, Bill Self's a master at this. I, I do trust in him to get this figured out. But you got to spread the ball around. You got to get everybody their shots. Uh, Martin and Yusefu in particular love to shoot. So uh, they'll have to figure that out. Might take them a little longer. Uh, maybe Maybe they've got it sorted out already. We'll have to find out. But, yeah, I think the way last year ended as well concerns me a little bit. You know, they they get the three seed. They struggle with Eastern Washington. They survive. Then they just get the doors blown off against USC. It left a little bit of a sour taste. Obviously, he did some great job to get some of the continuity back uh, this year. Uh, but it's also continuity that I had to experience that last year. And a couple of guys from Arizona State and Drake, two programs that aren't also used to tasting the level of success that Bill Self wants, so I'm, I'm caught somewhere in the middle. I, I think they belong in the top five for predictions and all that nationally. Uh, but I, I'm a little skeptical about where they're going to finish. Well, John, you, you've got to be clear that Remy Martin's going from Arizona State. But do you agree with Rocco that, that he's a guy that may not fit actually at Kansas because of how much he needs to shoot? Well, just to be a contrarian, I think the biggest input transfer for the Jayhawks is going to be Joseph Yusufu. Yeah. Um, sixth man of the year at Drake last year. 26 points and made six threes in the loss to USC in the first round last year when the entire Drake team was injured, it seemed like. Um, it's granted an anti-Remy Martin bias, I have, I admit, but I think Yusufu is going to be a huge addition for them, making the leap from mid-major to the highest of high majors. Matt, let me bring you in here. And we have actually have four new coaches in this conference this year. Well, well, uh, we got to talk about before we go to Matt, we got to talk about what Kansas is doing on December 11th. The border David, what is, is Kansas doing on December 11th? Well, I'll well, give the you border war is, The border war is back. And the one thing that y- you have to wonder is, is that game going to be a distraction for the other 29 that Kansas plays? Because okay. it is Every, so massive. Everybody, tune in the evening of December 10th. David will be doing a three-hour podcast <laughs> previewing the border war. Uh, all by himself, by the way. Not, I won't even be there, but... <laughs> That's yes, it is. The border war is back. Uh, I actually kind of like that it's back, and I hate to admit that given how much you love it, David. But, oh, oh, I but love it. It's Matt, back, Matt. The most significant coaching change is Chris Beard leaves Texas Tech, goes across state, goes to Texas, uh, and has a team that could be pretty darn good this year. Yeah, I think there's a ton of talent on paper. We know Beard could coach. Although I will say, I'm interested to see how Beard's going to do without Mark Adams at Texas Tech as a defensive guru. And then I know he's he's got a lot of other big names on the staff. He took Rodney Terry from UTEP. He took Chris Ogden away. And that brought the city head coaches. He brought him onto his staff. But I'm still to see how everything works with that, with that element and even all the transfers. And that in, they're not coming. The one we're bringing up things like Remy Martin, that Remy Martin, I think, had more college success than Marcus Carr or Trey Mitchell. So I'm interested to see how guys like that who have put up numbers but have not done so in winning situations will fit in for a team that clearly has, even in year one for Beard, minimum Sweet 16, uh, Sweet 60 aspirations and probably top two or three in the Big 12. That like, I think I could if everything clicks, I can see that they their ceilings one of the highest probably in college basketball. But I think they have. A, a worse floor than you might think of a team that, that's getting current now. I, I can see them being a 7-8 type seed if things fall apart a little bit. 
Well, and, and Joby, but the, this is the same Texas team. He mentioned a couple of names here. Trey Mitchell, who scores, I believe, over 18 points oh. a game at UMass. Uh, Marcus Carr, who had 30, I believe he scored 30 points four, three or four times at Minnesota last year. They, they, they got some real interesting talent that they're adding in here. Well, you know, they have seven players, seven players who scored 11 or more points for power five teams last year. Seven. I mean, not enough basketballs to go around could be an issue, but you know what? Chris Beard and I, and that, that might be the biggest uh, call because Chris Beard's style isn't necessarily saying, Hey, we're going to put up 90. That's not, you know, that's not how Chris Beard, you know, uh, uh, sets up the game. However, one thing Chris Beard did do at Texas tech over and over and over again is having people who came in transferred, you know, new guys, buy into his system and i think with Carr and jones they have an explosive uh backcourt that could be the most explosive in the country as far as the backcourt then you combine it with trey mitchell um this this team you know matt's right the 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 ceiling is just out out of this uh, yeah out of sight and i have a lot of faith in them not having a floor for the mere fact that Chris Beard has shown it in other areas in Lubbock to be able to uh, to be able to handle what's happening, you know, in terms of the roster. The question will be: Texas is a unique place in both football and basketball. Um, it people, you know, ha- he might not have much of a honeymoon. Uh, because the skeptics come out in Austin real quick. So if Texas doesn't do what they often do and eat their own quickly, I think that Beard will have a lot of success early with this team because the the roster and the talent is there. Yeah. About Texas being a unique place, um, Wake Forest made a coaching change when Dino Gaudio was there. I want to say that they were an eight or a nine seed and, and got rid of them. And I think they even won an NCAA tournament game. And I'm like, oh, we're getting rid of coaches after they make the tournament as a nine seed and win a game. Uh, we're getting rid of coaches that are inside the bubble now. Uh, Texas has just blown the, the, the ceiling off of that lid. Uh, they made a coaching change after Shaka Smart got a three seed. Now, granted, they lost early in the tournament, and because of that, I think people forget how good Texas really was up to that point. But, yeah, it, it, th- what they did is not normal, but what they ended up with is undeniably a top-10 team that might even be better than that. Uh, and don't forget, they, they won the conference tournament just a few days before that. Uh, it, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, anyway, it worked out good for Matt, but, uh, y- you know, wow, what a decision that was. Uh, yeah. well, uh, I'll, push, I'll, I'll technically he wasn't fired but that said it was very wise hey let's go before beard yeah beard was already lined up by all accounts let's be very honest here it's not like okay what? we have an opening oh let's call up that guy in lubbock and see if he'd be interested no yeah. this was in motion from this is in motion probably from december I mean, you know, I mean, that's, oh, we lost to Villanova at home. That must be awful. Uh, uh, Rocco, uh, Matt mentioned that Mark Adams did not come with, with beer to, to, uh, to Austin because he stayed in Lubbock as the new head coach there. Uh, How about the Red Raiders in the post Chris Beard era here? Yeah, so I, I guess Mark Adams himself is the biggest question mark, how he performs as a head coach. Clearly an amazing reputation as an assistant, defensive uh, backbone of, of what we know today as the Red Raider basketball program. I think what what the Red Raiders did this offseason, you know, they didn't get the glitz and glamour of the Texas players, but they got some quality players. And there are a couple of big names from the, from the under-the-radar ranks. Uh, I think at this point, everybody knows Kevin Obener from Oral Roberts, who was just rock solid playing all 40 minutes, sometimes even longer in those NCAA tournament games and throughout the Summit League tournament. Just a really solid player. Sadly, not at Oral Roberts anymore, in my opinion, but Red Raiders will love to have him. Another guy from the portal who I really uh, like a lot. He's played four years of college basketball, gets a COVID year, Bryson Williams. He was their standout in their most recent scrimmage. I think he's a big time player. 
You also got Santos Silva, Terrence Shannon, and Kevin McCuller coming back. And you had guys like Adonis Arms, who's just a specimen from Winthrop, um, and Malik Wilson from Louisiana. There is a ton of experience. There's not one scholarships freshman on this team. So the, the roster makeup is built to win now. And with the pedigree of Mark Adams uh, to instill his defense, you know, I think a lot of people have him somewhere between 25 and 30. I, I think they're going to sneak in the top 20 if they can make the most of what the pieces he has are. Uh, so I, I'm really high on this team right now. Did you ever mention Terrence Shannon in that, in that whole list? I did. I did. Okay. Yeah. okay. I, <laughs> but, I, but yeah, I mean, obviously that there's, I, I'm with you. I think this Texas tech team is, is a solid uh, team could be contending for protected seat. That's probably a little bit too high, but you know, five, six seed type of team at the yeah. end of the day. Uh, I'm there with you. Um, John, another new head coach in this conference, uh, Porter Moser finally leaves Loyola and he's heading to Oklahoma. So I was surprised because I thought that he was going to be one of those guys who just stays where he is for his whole life and becomes a legend. And he kind of is a legend at Loyola, let's be frank. But uh, this team last year, so let's start with the Sooners. They were 14 and five last year, looking great. They lost four straight to finish the regular season. Then they almost pulled off the miracle comeback. They trailed Kansas by 23 in the first half of the Big 12 quarterfinals and only lost by single digits. Then they ran into Gonzaga and the tourney. Good luck. Um, they also lost their three best players from last year, Austin Reeves, Davion Harmon, Brady Mannix. So luckily, it's no longer Lon Kruger's problem. It's Porter Moser's problem. But um, he's going to ease him in the season with several cupcakes. After Thanksgiving, four straight non-conference games against top 75 teams. UCF, Florida, Butler, Arkansas. So you better get a lot of experience against the cupcakes. What I'm most excited to see, uh, Rocco mentioned it before we started the show, pair of Eastern Washington transfers and how they do in Big 12 play. Tanner and Jacob Gro Groves, last time we saw them in Eastern Washington, they were combining to score 58 in a loss to Kansas in the NCAA tournament. So if there's any transfers in America who know how to play in the conference they're in, it's the Groves brothers who prove they can play with the best of the Big 12. So you like Oklahoma where? The Not at the top. I think they're like a top 25 team. Uh, I think that they'll finish in the top four in the conference, Not maybe not top two. And I think they'll make the tournament and I think they'll win a game. But um, I like that they have experience. It's one thing to bring in transfers who are like, oh, he scored 20 a game at some conference I never heard of and was good. But these guys scored 20 a game in the tournament against Kansas, like they can, they can make it to the second weekend. Matt, you with him? Yeah, oh, I, I think yeah. What they lost, especially I think Davian Harmon. I think he's going to be a stud for Oregon. I like, lose him, and then we'll see the goes. I mean, as awesome as they were in Kansas, that was one game. We'll see how they do over eighteen games against probably the top league in the country. And that I think down the line, Moses can do really good. I love a couple of the recruits he's bringing in in this twenty twenty two class. But I think he'll need them this year. I think, yeah, lost too much. And they'll be okay, but I would think bubble and the wrong side of the bubble is where I'm kind of thinking. Really? I think okay. there's a couple of teams that we haven't mentioned yet. They'll finish higher than them. Well, one of the another team that we haven't mentioned yet, David, uh, Oklahoma State. No Cade Cunningham, but a lot of other guys back. Yeah, I kind of like this Oklahoma State team. I, I think they're going to finish in the top half of the conference and bank the NCAA tournament. They're, they're, they, like you said, they, they arguably lost their best player, but they have four. Arguably, of their top five definitely, back. definitely. Well, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I, I would argue that they definitely <laughs> lost their best player. And, but yeah, they have four of their five, of their best five back, and they have a lot of other guys that can step up from off the bench. I really like this Oklahoma State team. I, I want to say they were picked fifth at media day. I think they're going to be better than that. I, I like them inside the bubble and in, in making the tournament and finishing in the top half of the conference. Joe, be there with that team. Sorry, Joby, did we lose you? Jo Joby doesn't know what to say. He, he's a guest. <laughs> All right, uh, we may have lost Joby. Uh, uh, okay, um, well, uh, Joby, you're back. Yes. Okay. Did, what are you, yeah. Okay. We we got Joby back. I just asked you if you agree with David on, on this Oklahoma State team. Well, I, I agree that they lost their best player. <laughs> okay. I also 
also feel they lost their best player and didn't replace him with a, really a whole lot. I, I think this Oklahoma State team, which I, with Cunningham, was so high on. Uh, I, I, I just don't, I just think he made everything go. And I think the whole thing will crumble without him. And I think crumble. Yeah, I think they're going to, they're going to come back down to earth in a massive way. This is not their other four starters back. This is not a tournament team. Yeah, it is a tournament. Four starters, four stars who, if Cade Cunningham weren't there, wasn't there, four starters who would have been mm, not even the NIT last year. Well, that's two teams we've had disagreements on. Rocco, if we find a team with an agreement on, maybe West Virginia. Well, we're going to agree on the last one. Yeah, so the Mountaineers, you know, this this upcoming year, it's it's kind of more like Huggins and his uh, you know long list of seasons that he's coached. You, you kind of got to bank on him to get get the team to the tournament. Uh, but the roster itself, I mean, Taz Sherman and Sean McNeil are are back to lead, and it's a really pretty old roster. There's six of the t- first eight, or, or excuse me, seven of the first eight are seniors or COVID seniors. Um, and Jalen Bridge is only redshirt sophomore. Um, at, that's not a senior. So th- that experience is amazing. The coach is amazing, but it's like, I, I don't know who the, the, the guy who's just going to fill it up all the time is like a Miles McBride last year, or even a force like they have with Derek Culver. Obviously she left them early last year too. I don't see anybody with that uh, caliber. So I think they're uh, probably for me preseason in the thirties, which lands them in the seven, eight, nine seed range. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I, I don't know how they're going to get higher than that with this roster. I also could see a, a, a potential just because we saw it in 2019 where things could completely fall apart, like, like that season. So we'll see. So Matt, are, are you, where are you on this team? <laughs> you- I would mildly disagree with Rocco in that I actually think they have a pretty high floor. Their ceilings okay. by a little limited is that I don't know if they have an absolute, like, maybe even first or second team, all Big 12 level player, but they have a bunch of guys who maybe be like fourth, fifth, or sixth team, but like Sean McNeil. And a kid, I think actually, if you have a breakout player on that roster, Jalen Bridges, incredibly efficient as a role player. Right. If he can keep some of his efficiency in a much more featured role this season. I think he could be jump up, and that might be the guy who second or third team Big Twelve, and and that would carry them to say maybe third or fourth. I think they'll be somewhere probably between fourth and sixth, solidly in the tournament. Don't seem a threat to do a huge amount in the tournament, but again, sometimes you never know. I mean, I've seen worse teams than that. I Syracuse do a whole lot better in the tournament. <laughs> Culver was such a key component of glue. I mean, you know, the, he defined what a glue guy is, especially in the backcourt. It, it, it will be it will be very interesting because does the system that Huggins has put together for so many years with so much success continue? I think it does. But, you know, that's a loss that, you know, could be felt really dramatic. John. Jamie Dixon's TCU squad, uh, you know, d- is there anything here? There's a lot of transfers coming in uh, other than Mike Miles. So any chance that they could, you know, be a dark horse? I like Emmanuel Miller. He did some good things at yeah. A&M. Um, I'm less sold on guys like Shahada Wells and Xavier Cork. I love Mike Miles. Um, mm-hmm. All he did last summer was win a gold medal playing for his coach, Jamie Dixon, on Team USA at the 2021 FIBA U19 World Cup. When you can win a gold medal with a coach, I mean, what more does it take to have the coach believe in you and trust you on the court? Um, The schedule looks pretty manageable. Utah, A&M, Georgetown, LSU, in terms of non-conference play, um, certainly not in the top half of the Big 12, but I think Miles could be a first-team all-conference point guard. Okay. Do you think this team could could find its way towards the bubble? Yes, but unfortunately, they're going to need five more wins to get to the bubble. Okay. And, and the problem is you've got to play these other teams we've all discussed. Um, a couple of things we have not yet discussed. David, we have another new head coach in the conference on an Iowa State team that won two games all of last year, went 0-18 in conference. And the best they could do is TJ Otzelberger off of a couple of very mediocre years at UNLV. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> Iowa State is falling up. It's, um, you, you know, they won the Stallings last year. They might be in the running for it again this year. I, I think they're going to be improved, but they're in the unique position. Well, it's of hard to get worse in 2022. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it'd still be really, really bad. Uh, I, I said that there would be a consensus on this team earlier when I said, oh, there's going to be one we agree on. This is the one that I was talking about. They will not be good. They will not be good. No, they won't. Uh, Rocco, another team that I don't know is going to be very good either. Uh, the last thing we have to discuss today is Kansas State. Yeah, it, it's a it's a little bit of a mystery team. Uh, so last year, of course, they were the doormat of the league. Uh, but really interestingly, they got hot the last like four games. They won a couple. They took Baylor to the last possession. And a big key to that was Mike McGuirl, you know, their, their veteran senior. He decides to come back and use his COVID year. Uh, they also were building a lot of experience with their freshman class. You know, Bruce Weber built a really good freshman class two years ago based on their Elite Eight run. And it was consisted of N Nigel Pack, Davian Bradford, Selton Miguel, and, and Luke Kasupke. And they're all going to take that freshman sophomore leap this year. I've been reading a lot of great reports in their, in their uh, practice stuff, which is whatever. But they also took on Oregon over the weekend in Denver in a scrimmage and beat them in four of the five different sections however they break that scrimmage up which really kind of caught my eye uh plus mark smith joins who was in the tournament last year for missouri um so i do think there's a lot of interesting parts here uh and if those four freshmen i think it's really up to them to make that sophomore leap could really change the dynamic of this team and um you know i i, I certainly think they'll be much better than last year it's just how high can they climb all right fair enough uh at this point what i'd like to do is run through each of you uh, have you tell us who you think the conference champion is going to be, how many teams are going to make the field, and also throw out any other final thoughts you may have about the league. Uh, Joby, if we still have you on the screen, let me start with you. Yeah, uh, Texas, I'm going to go, this will be a shockingly low number, uh, five. Woo, um, that is shockingly low. And the reason why is because I think the top of this conference is so good. Uh, that they will not lose to the middle and the bottom a whole lot, thus leaving poor records, you know, uh, poor conference records in their wake. I, you know, you, you heard me on Oklahoma State already. You know, you know I, I'm not, also not as high in Oklahoma and some others. I think, I think that group of Kansas and Baylor and Texas, I think they're going to be beating each other but not losing a whole lot like in the years past. You had 0 and 18 at the bottom Iowa State giving wins away. I think it's the bottom is actually a little better. You know, Kansas State, you know, is a little better. And the top is even more accelerated up. I mean, the top three, that's the best top three of any conference in America. So it's not a reflection of saying the Big 12 stinks. It's just it's not as deep and it's top heavy. Yeah. And you know, when you look at what happened last year. Uh, Baylor ran away with the conference with 13 and one uh, between second and seventh place was six, seven or eight losses in conference. They were all bunched up. And I understand what you're saying. Now we're not going to have that bunch up in the middle that got us to seven bits last year. We're going to have two or three teams in that top two. You're that have five knock. teams with winning. Yeah. It'll look normal. You'll have five teams with winning records, five teams with losing records in conference. And I don't know if the five teams with losing records will be able to have compiled a good enough resume otherwise, because I'm not as high on them, you know, as I was last year to get that bit. All right. You'd be looking at, can those eight and 10 conference teams make, make the field? Right. Matt, what, what are your right. thoughts? Yeah, I actually I disagree a little bit. I have six teams in, I have Kansas winning joined by uh, Baylor, Texas, Texas Tech, West, West Virginia, and Oklahoma State, who I'm much higher on. And one name I'm going to mention, Bryce Thompson. The last time we had a guard who came into Kansas with a lot of hype, didn't quite make it there, transferred out. He was a, became a first-round pick in the NBA named Quentin Grimes. I would not be surprised if Bryce Thompson has that same story in Oklahoma State. And also, we didn't mention too much. Musa Sisse, yes. the five, gives him a legitimate protector that they really didn't have last year either. So even without Cunningham, I think I'm the opposite. I think they could be a better team without him. We've still got I, I, enough parts that all together, and I think guys like Avery Anderson, Thompson, mm -hmm. and that rise up to where, like, now I think I mentioned them six, but I think they could be anywhere third or fourth in the league. CC has that high ceiling that you refer to. 
I, I need to see more though. I didn't like what he did at Memphis. Yeah, he I thought I expected a lot more out of him, you know, in that regard. I, I'm 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 I've got Oklahoma State as my seventh place team and I've got six bids. Uh you know, if it got to seven, I, I would be with you, Matt. But I, I think Oklahoma is a step above them. Maybe not a big step, maybe a small step, but uh, they've but I've got six teams in myself. I also have Texas winning it. Uh John, what about you? We got Kansas winning it all. Uh, I'm going to go out and let me say they're so good that they're going to beat Michigan State on November 9th by double digits. Wow. Um, I think that I'll, if the over-under was set at five by Joby, I'll take a push. I think Kansas, Baylor, Texas Tech, Texas make it easily. Um, I still think Oklahoma will make it ahead of Oklahoma State or West Virginia. Um, I don't see this getting much more than six bids, so I'll stick with five. Um, as far as a fun fact, I'll take you back to the 2016 McDonald's All-American game. So Jason Tatum, one member last November, he signed a $195 million extension with the Celtics. Bam Adebayo, another player, signed a $163 million extension with Miami last November. What did Andrew Jones, a 2016 McDonald's All-American, do last November? He scored 13 points and a win over Davidson. I don't know if he's ever going to get the riches that his former All-American teammates did. The fact that he's alive after surviving leukemia, he's already a winner in my book. Still kind of can't believe he's in college, but I wish him the best of luck because he's a good kid from what I hear and he's playing well. And I hope he gets a chance to shine in March. Great, I feel so point. unaccomplished. <laughs> Rocco. <laughs> yeah. So for the top of the league, um, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say Baylor, Kansas, and Texas, all three-way tie for first at 14 oh. 14 and four. Cop out. It's a cop out. <laughs> one seed in the tournament. Who wins the tiebreaker, Rocco? Who there wins the tiebreaker? Well, you're, you're, give me a second. I was going to say, so Baylor wins the tiebreaker, gets the number one seed. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that's my bold pick there. But they're going to do it in a, in a tie. Uh, Texas Tech, a clear fourth for me. I think West Virginia and Oklahoma State are very close, five and six. Right now I have West Virginia just a hair above. Uh, my surprise uh, Kansas State team is uh, I got them seventh, uh, but not getting into the tournament. I also uh, have Oklahoma TCU and then Iowa State distant tenth. But I do think if uh, the key to this league, uh, my final thought on it would be, um, I think there is a potential, and not to disagree with Joby, everything he said could definitely be equally as true. Uh, I do do think the keys to this league are Oklahoma TCU and Kansas State. If they reach their mat- potential, uh, glad. Mike Miles was talked about because he's going to be a big time scorer for TCU with a lot of veterans. Uh, if Kansas State hits their potential, if Oklahoma does uh, even anywhere near the bubble type of work, this is going to probably end up being the strongest league in the country. And so that's that's what I'm leaning on at this point. I, I, the strongest top league, I'm, I, I still got to feel the Big Ten may outrank them, but it's going to be one. I think it will one, be one, two at the end of the day between the two conferences. It's going to be close. Yeah, it's just it, I think it just comes down to if there's only one bad team with Iowa State, then then they're going to win out. But if uh, if a couple of these teams have bad years, then obviously that sways things. Yeah, but but if Iowa State could, could only can't even win their non-conference games, I could pull the whole league down as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. They could be in the two hundreds. Uh, uh, David. Okay. Um, I have Texas to win the league. I think both Kansas and Texas are Final Four caliber teams. Uh, it could go either way, but I, I really like Chris Beard. I like they, – they've got so many weapons. And every year that Chris Beard was at Texas Tech, you're like, if you thought they were going to be average, they were above average. If you thought they were going to be decent, they were really good. This is a guy that – I don't know how many times they started the season off unranked and then contended for a protected seat or went to an Elite Eight or in, you know, became the national runner up. He's just a fantastic coach. Not that Bill Self isn't, but I really think he gets them going in Texas. The number of teams that get in, I think there are a lot of good teams in this league. I think a lot of teams in this league gave themselves chances to win big games out of conference. I'm going with seven teams. Here's why there's two teams in this league that are terrible. If whoever it is that's in seventh, be it whether it's Oklahoma, TCU, West Virginia, Oklahoma State, everybody that we talked about to the four of seven range, whoever it is that's in seventh, I think they beat the two games that they play against the bottom two teams in this league. That's four wins. In the other 14 games, if they can win four of those, which I definitely think they can, given the chances they'll have at home and on the road, 
that's eight and ten. If it, it also sets up a, a, a game in the seven ten game of the conference tournaments to get them the nine conference wins. I think the seventh place team in this league, if they win nine games in this conference and then do something, anything out of conference, the seventh team is getting in. So they're going to get in based on a seven ten win over a pathetically bad Iowa State team. I, I got it, David. We're going to be talking about that one. Well, no, <laughs> okay, I, I just don't point. think that if it is the top ranked league, which I think it will be, I think if they avoid the bad losses in the four or five games that they play, if they get if they get those five and then can get four more at any other point along the way, which I think they can, that we're going to see seven out of this league. And, uh, I do agree with you. I think eight and ten is going to have you on the bubble in this conference. I, I, yeah. I, I, that, that That's, you know. I don't know that we get to seven, but I think I think we'll be discussing seven teams very easily. Uh, on that note, though, I do want to take this chance to thank everybody for joining us. This has been our SEC preview. You can check out all the other conference previews again up there on the season preview tab. You can check out all the exhibition games on the exhibition game tab. Uh, we'll and and Chad, it. it's also the, it's also been the Big Twelve preview. It was it SEC? Yeah, it's been. Yeah, yeah, I did say SEC. <laughs> It's the last year in the double round robin format. I hate. It is the Big Twelve preview. Uh, um, I think we got one more year. I, I, well, it depends on when Texas and Oklahoma actually actually. Oh, leave. okay. So, 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 so we'll, we'll we'll see when all that happens. But um, this has been our Big Twelve preview. If I got that right, I don't know. Maybe it's been our SWAC preview for all I know. But our Big Twelve preview. We will have uh, more previews coming up later this week. But on behalf of John Titel and David Griggs, Matt Zakowski. Rocco Miller for Bracketeer.org, Joey Fortson. I'm Chad Sherwood. Thanks for joining us. We'll be talking to you again real soon.